Good afternoon. My name is Tiagi Ram, and my wife, Tiagi Dikshini, and we live here in Los Angeles, and our presentation this morning is on the journey of self-realization. I'd like to start off with a Sanskrit chant from the Vedas, which is entitled the Hymn to Brahma, Brahma Nandam. Brahmananda Paramasukadam Kevalam Gyanamurti Gandhwatita Gaganasadrisha Vamasya di Lakshan Ekam Nityam Dimalam Achalam Savadi Sakshi Bhuta Bhavatita Triguna Rahita Sadgurum Twam Mami Oh occasion of Paramahansa Yogananda's 100th anniversary of coming to America. When he first came to the United States, Master didn't chant these ancient mantras of, of the Vedas. He transliterated them into English and his first opportunity was in 1924 in New York City at Carnegie Hall. 6,000 people packed that auditorium. 
And Yogananda said, today I'm going to introduce to the American people the power of chanting for their own self-realization. One of his students said, oh, 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 Guruji, don't, don't, don't do that. These Americans, they come with rotten fruits and vegetables to these occasions. If they don't like what you have to say or the songs that you sing, they'll start throwing them at you. <laughs> we don't do that so much today. But he said no. They will understand the power of these, these chants, these songs, these mantras that I've translated, and they will be touched by them. And so he, he, he translated this one uh, song from uh, Guru Nanak of the Sikh religion, O oh God Beautiful. And he sang that for over an hour. And people were dancing in the, uh, in the Carnegie Hall to the music. And many people were transformed and touched that day. The journey of self-realization is a very personal journey. We come into this world alone. We, the saying is we don't choose our parents, but that's a lie. Everyone chooses the families that they're born into. You have a karmic connection with them. I know I was blessed to be born into a family here, a great spiritual family. My, my father was a, was a warrior. He was a major in the army and my mother took me to church every Sunday. I knew those people. And they brought me up in a way that introduced me to the concept of a universal reality, which we call God. And when one day I stood up in the church service that I, of my uh, congregation that I belonged to, and I said, you know, I've been here all my life, but there's something wrong, there's something missing here. I feel your love and compassion but there's something missing. I was 18 years old, and then shortly after that, Autobiography of a Yogi was collecting dust in my family home. It, did, it didn't materialize there, in some ways it did. But it was, my brother had gone to the Self-Realization Fellowship and bought a copy of Autobiography and left it there in my family home here in, in uh, South Central Los Angeles. I began to look at the photographs of that book and gradually over time I began to read the Bible quotes that Yogananda gave in his autobiography and then I began to read the whole book in its entirety when I reached the age of 24. Now for some of you who, who might know astrology, <laughs> Vedic astrology especially, when we're born the planet Jupiter is symbolic of guru in our lives. It's, it's shining a vibration and instructive influence into our lives. And every 12 years, the planet Jupiter revolves in our horoscope. And so when I reached the age of 24, so 12, 24, if you look at those cycles in your own life, you'll find that in those time periods, there's a great change in your life. These things happen universally, no matter if you follow Yogananda's teachings or not. I reached the age of 24, and I took initiation into Yogananda's path of self-realization as my guru, and started studying the Self-Realization Fellowship lessons at that time, but felt a lack, I must say, I remember going to the Hollywood church and taking the first uh, study course with Brother Bhaktananda, who was one of the direct disciples under Yogananda, who was in charge of the self-realization Hollywood church. And I often go there even today to meditate in the gardens. Very strong vibration. But it wasn't until that I was guided out of Los Angeles and, and met Swami Kriyananda at Ananda Village and took the Kriya Yoga initiation for the first time. Kriya is the highest of our meditation practices. But Yogananda, when he came, he, he would often pinch his flesh and he said, if you only knew how to explode the atoms in one gram of your flesh, 
you could light the city of Chicago for a week. You have unlimited energy, and yet you complain you're tired and run down or sick or ill. Yogananda's path of self-realization is a very practical journey of your own spiritual unfoldment so that you come to realize that everything that has happened to you, whether you so call it, you call it good or bad, pleasure or pain, <clears throat> health or sickness, or even death itself, it's all nothing but a dream. And you're here to learn lessons from the dream that we're living right now. <clears throat> Our world is, is, in the, is in a quagmire. This coronavirus is really shaking things up. Because it's testing our ability to lift the veils, we call the veils of Maya, or cosmic delusion, that, that makes this life seem so real. <clears throat> Yogananda said, when we meditate, that veil of cosmic delusion gradually dissipates and you begin to see that this is nothing more than a play of light and shadow. And that we're here to learn the ultimate lesson that God is the only reality. I was reading uh, just this past week on the internet and how in Iceland, the government of Iceland has declared all religion false. And I, I said, wow, they're condemning themselves to darkness. We're only going to follow what science tells us to do. And there's a certain point where science fails us. And that's where Yogananda's teachings come in. His first book that he wrote was entitled The Science of Religion. To help us to understand that there are practices, and these are the practices from the ancient Vedas, from the Rishis, Patanjali's Ashtanga Yoga, the Eightfold Path of, of, uh, of Awakening, these are all teachings that will help us to lift the veils of unknowing in a very practical and scientific way. And that's what the journey of self-realization is all about. You don't really have to believe in anything. There was one friend of mine, he was a jazz singer. Uh, his name was Herb Jeffries. He sang for Duke Ellington's band and um, he was very famous. Uh, he was actually Italian, but he, he uh, was hanging out with Duke Ellington and became very famous as a jazz singer in, in those circles. And he uh, had a severe uh, airplane crash, and he was <clears throat> in severe pain, and he heard of Yogananda, and he came to Yogananda and said, Hey, can you heal me? And Yogananda said, well, I, I, I think so. Well, um, you, but, but you have to promise, you have to answer a few questions. You know, I do a lot of things in, in my world. Um, do your teachings forbid the drinking alcohol? No. Do your teachings forbid having a promiscuous relationship with uh, other people? No. Does your teachings denounce the accumulation of wealth? No. And, uh, well, why do all these other teachings say that? Well, they're there to help us to understand that there are doorways to higher awareness. All the things that we call the three vices of sex, wine, and money are simply doorways to higher realities. And really, those are the tests that we are confronted with daily so that we can come to a deeper understanding and level of consciousness. This is the journey of self-realization. To know thyself means not to hide away in a monastery. To know thyself means to experience life on a day-to-day -day basis for what it is, but having an other-minded attitude this concept of being other-minded 
is a very important principle that Yogananda taught. He said, every situation that we experience in life is neutral. You can color it good or bad, but once we touch in with the inner paradise from within, nothing in the world can touch us. Yogananda, when he first came to America, this, there was a fellow who came to him, very uh, prominent Bostonian Brahmin. His name was Dr. Lewis. He was a dentist. And he came to Yogananda. He told his wife it was Christmas 1920, Christmas Eve 1920. And, and uh, Dr. Lewis said, you know, uh, he told his wife, listen, I'm going to go out for a little, uh, a little bit in the car, and I'll be back and we'll decorate the tree and, and uh, put the kids to bed and, you know, prepare the gifts for tomorrow morning. The wife didn't know where he was going. And Yogananda had this appointment to meet Yogananda at the YMCA in Boston. That's where Yogananda was, was staying at the time. So Dr. Lewis comes in and he says, I have only one question for you. It says in the Bible that the light of the body is the eye. Jesus says, and if thy eye is single, thy whole body will be filled with light. Have you seen that inner light, that inner eye? And Yogananda said, I think so. And uh, can you show other people how to see this inner light, this spiritual eye? I think so. And Dr. Lewis said, well, will you please show me now? You have to promise me one thing, sir, that you'll never avoid me ever in your life. And he thought that was an interesting response, that you will never avoid me? No, I, I'll never avoid you. Now, Yogananda had dark skin like myself, and uh, Dr. Lewis, he could see in him that he had certain prejudices of mind and was very skeptical seeing this uh, dark Hindu there. And, uh, Yogananda had just come off the boat. He had lectured in Boston and he, he, was, he was a big phenomenon in town. Dr. Lewis was a prominent you know, Bostonian Brahmin, dentist. Yogananda wanted to instill in him divine friendship. Friendship is the greatest thing, and the friendship of one who develops the relationship of a true guru, one who can lift the veils of darkness out of your life to attain the light, is a very uh, important relation. It's the greatest of relationships. I know when I first came to this path, I m immediately knew Yogananda was my, my guru of incarnations. And it was, has been a relationship that I had before. We are only nothing more than the tip of an iceberg of incarnations, folks. How many billions of people are on this planet and, and we have maybe 30 people in this room at this moment of eternity? It's not by chance that you're listening to me at this point in this 100th anniversary of Yogananda, it's not by chance. This whole life is a journey of self-realization, and not just this life. We are starting into motion when you begin the spiritual journey. We begin to start into motion incarnations of cultivating the desire to know the truth. And that truth will one day set you free. So Dr. Lewis said, show me this inner light. And Yogananda said, okay, promise me one thing, that you'll never avoid me. Give me your in unconditional friendship. He said, I'll never avoid you in my life, and I give you my unconditional friendship, and I give you my unconditional love. Yogananda put his hands together. Good, now I can take charge of your life. And he
put he put laid a woolen blanket on the on the floor or on a, it was in this case on the floor. But these are the techniques that Yogananda gives for those who are starting the path, or putting a woolen blanket over a chair. But he put Dr. Lewis on the floor, and Dr. Lewis said, uh, "I sat cross-legged on this woolen blanket. And I was so stiff I could barely sit." And Yogananda sat in front of me, and he put his forehead against my forehead and projected the inner light that he was seeing. That we have an image of this light above us in, on the altar. The golden ring, the blue field, and the five-pointed white star. And I closed my eyes, and Yogananda said, now focus here at the, the Kustasta Chaitanya, the, the point between the eyebrows, the spiritual eye. And all of a sudden, Dr. Lewis went crazy. He went into a state of ecstasy. He saw this golden ring, this blue field, and this five-pointed white star as Yogananda was projecting into him. And he felt so happy. For several hours, they were in this bliss state of communing with this inner light. It was about 2 o'clock in the morning, and Dr. Lewis bid Yogananda goodbye, and he arrived at his, his, at his home in, in Somerville, Massachusetts. 24 Electric Avenue. If any of you are in Somerville, go to 24 Electric Avenue. <laughs> his house is still there. That YMCA is still there. He walked in the back door, and here his wife, his, his name, her name was Mildred, and she was there with a rolling pin. And she says, where have you been? I've been worried. You said you'd be right back. He said, dear, I just met Swami Yogananda for the first time. And he showed me the inner light. And she looked at him. He was glowing with radiance and like a child. There's an expression in India of the guru-disciple relationship is Chela. The Chela is the child of the Guru. And I must say, after following this path for over 40 years myself, it's been the greatest blessing of my life and my spiritual journey. Usually I invite Swami Yogananda to um, give the opportunity to my husband to talk all the time and then I go, I'm sorry, I don't have any more time. Um, but today I told her that there is something I maybe I could share. Yeah. Um, this uh, uh, saying's journey to self-realization, I was thinking about it and then I realized that uh, it's, it's happening every moment in our lives, every moment, right now. And uh, uh, during we are working or interacting with people, and uh, I love Hawaii. Maybe you can see from my flower. And uh, um, there is a series. It's called Hawaii Five O. Maybe some of you have heard of it. And uh, it's uh, many shootings and <laughs> different things, but. In deep, in deep level, they uh, tell you uh, they um, uh, it's a spiritual uh, TV series. There is one part when uh, one uh, person tells to the other that listen to your heart, because she is about to do a, a very uh, uh, big decision, and she, he just whispers him, listen to your heart. And I was, it's, it caught, it's, oh, I, I'm listening and uh, watching this TV series again and again and again. And uh, when I uh, come to this part, I, it always touches me so much. And then I realized uh, that uh, this is uh, nothing else but just listen to God. Because our heart is always tells you, always, my heart always tells you what to do, what is the right thing to do. And there is this, uh, uh, Indian saying that uh, um, yato dharma, tato jaya, where is right action, there is victory. And uh, we so many times we are so scared to listen to our hearts, to do the right thing, because it can be very frightening. 
like uh, I want to share just one. Uh, I have man, I have many stories just uh, during from during from the past week, but uh, one is was very scary. I uh, we were in Hawaii. <laughs> we came back two weeks ago, and of course uh, there is accumulated mail, and in the mail there was again this. Uh, letter for jury duty. And I think it, many of you can relate to that. Nobody likes to do it. And um, I said, oh, again, because I had to, to go through this two, two years ago. And um, but um, I said, yeah, I have to do it. I have to do it the right way. I cannot skip anything. So I, I did everything as it was um, described. I had to do it. And um, I uh, made everything uh, okay with my uh, workplace. And then uh, today morning I called them, uh, you know, if I have to go or not. And it was, no, you don't have to report on Monday. <laughs> this is uh, just God's uh, grace and rewarding that, okay, you, 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 uh, you were brave enough to uh, um, face your challenge. For me, it's a, it's a challenge. Um, and. Uh, so God just, uh, I took it that way. He rewarded me with this that I didn't have to go. And uh, I don't know what the time. This is adorable. Yeah. One, one more other very sweet story. We had an adorable, adorable little cat. And um, we found out that he, she had some little issues and we had to take her to the veterinary. But that one is a, a, such a trauma for her and, and after for me because I have to hear, listen to her crying and yelling on the way to the vet and the way back. And uh, we had to t do it again. And I said, but we have to do it because it's for her interest, uh, for her well-being. Well -being. And so we put her again in the car on Friday or Thursday and she was quiet. All the time she was quiet all the way there and the doctor was praising her that she's a little hero but she didn't, she had to get a shot and uh, she didn't say a word and on the way back she didn't cry, she was just quiet and again I thought that yeah this is again a sign that um, I did the right thing, I wasn't fearful I, because I had in my back of my mind okay uh, I will postpone this <laughs> next time I, don't, I didn't want to. Uh, face this situation, but uh, everything went so well, and uh, that, that's uh, that's my journey for self-realization. <laughs> Every day I have, I am in different uh, trials, and uh, and I always know what is the right thing to do, and uh, even if I want to procrastinate it, I I just do it, and uh, without the thought that oh God will reward me, I don't think about that, and but God. Yet, still, he rewards me. So. Thank you all.